it, it's an amazing duality that we live in. Yet that is when somebody is willing to be vulnerable, how much we look at them with so much courage. Yet when we think about ourselves being vulnerable, we think, oh, shame. It's an amazing thing. Yet that's the thing that really binds connection. Um, Colbert, thank you so much for being here. Please. Thank you. Aloha. <laughs> okay. Um, Pono asked me to share a story with you, and I'm not as good a storyteller as Pono. I got a picture. Picture up. Oh, okay. We got, this is important. Sorry. <laughs> because she walked back from Japan. <laughs> you put a full position. Thank you, Cole. Awesome. But uh, uh, what I wanted to do was today was to share with you a story about uh, my growing up. Uh, I was born and raised on the island of Lanai, and I grew up there during the 1950s and 1960s when island, uh, Lanai was uh, a pineapple plantation. And what I wanted to share with you today was uh, a short story about an experience that I had while I was growing up that influenced me and really helped uh, shape my understanding of organizations and the potential uh, for organizations. This is a picture of uh, Lanai City uh, back in the 1960s. And so it was a town where 500 people lived. Virtually the entire population of the island lived in this uh, uh, community. And all of them were connected to the whole company and involved in cultivating 65,000 acres of pineapple on the plantation. There was then, and still today, only one public school called Lanai High and Elementary School with 600 students from K to 12. And it was in 1966 that uh, a public school teacher named Lloyd Inaba joined the faculty and proceeded to establish a band program on the island. And then within three years, uh, he proposed that we host a statewide band festival on Lanai. Uh, it was an uh, audacious uh, uh, proposal because uh, we had uh, 2,500 people. There was no resort on the island. Like today, you know, there's the Four Seasons, Coele, Four Seasons, Manele. Back then, we had a 10-room hotel, Lanai. <laughs> and there were no restaurants, no taxi cabs, uh, certainly no commercial buses. And there was only one daily scheduled airline flight in and out of London. And so it was really inconceivable that a plantation community with 2,500 people and such limited resources could play host to such an event. Yet, uh, he was able to mobilize the community to stretch for that audacious goal. And what happened was that over 500 you know, high school students from throughout the state uh, descended on the island during a week in 1969 and had an unforgettable experience. Our tiny community was inspired by a vision and with leadership, collaboration, and people working together, we were able to prove our, uh, to ourselves what our tiny community was capable of accomplishing. It was our strong sense of community that was able to rally all segments of our community to share their resources, volunteer their time and skills, shoulder the inconveniences and personal sacrifices that the event required. No one required recognition, no one required any reward, just the satisfaction that their collective efforts had given the young people participating in the event 
a memory to inspire them in their lives ahead. Why, why do I share this story with you? Because you are all participants in an ambitious undertaking. The goal of transforming state government uh, through our IT infrastructure is an audacious goal. It's inconceivable from, I think, all of our individual perspectives uh, and all of your perspectives, I'm sure, because it's never been, uh, it's never been uh, taken on. Uh, nobody has even attempted to do that. But you're at the beginning of that undertaking. And as ambitious as it is, it's an important undertaking because what all of you are about to participate in is an opportunity to not just transform the IT infrastructure of the state of Hawaii, but you have the opportunity to actually transform our, our consciousness as a community through this undertaking. And that's why I think that the effort that you're gonna put into this, the collective effort that all of you are going to put into this, this mission, this undertaking that you're gonna be embarking upon is so important because you're not gonna just change the content, but you're gonna change the context in which all of us live and function. And I think that through that process, uh, we will transform who we are and how we live. So I commend you all on being participants in this undertaking. It's ambitious, it's very challenging, and our community is going to really be uh, benefited by all of your efforts and sacrifices as you embark on this uh, course. And so I thank you all for the roles that you're gonna play. And I hope that my sharing the story of my experience on the tiny island of Lanai and what we were able to accomplish in that week is an example of something that of, that you can take confidence in, in terms of the much greater undertaking and challenge that uh, you are about to uh, embark upon. So thank you. Thank you, Colbert. Robbie. Colbert, when was that picture? 1965, probably. Same today. <laughs> <laughs> Just got a sticker resort on each end, same today. <laughs> Been there not too long ago, same today. Um, I, you know, I, I too have a story. Um, I don't know if we should clear the screen, but uh, um, my story goes back to 1993. I was uh, finishing up 11 years as Uh, Director of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, which I really enjoyed, uh, but it was time to do something else. And I got a call from, uh, from a senator, uh, head of a committee called Government Operations, uh, something McCartney uh, was his name, um, <laughs> at any rate. Uh, he asked if I would lead a task force to reorganize state government. So I <laughs> you know, took a deep breath and thought, okay, Mike's a friend, so what the hell. So we gathered like 45 people on uh, my living room floor, and it took us two nights, like three hours, to get around the room. And everybody come back for a second night. And everybody laid out what they really loved or didn't like about state government. Um, and, and near the end, there was a guy named George Mason. George was the publisher of Pacific Business News. Uh, now, George disliked state government with a passion. Uh, you know, he hated bureaucrats and hated government. Probably the government, part of government he hated the most was business registration, which was under me at DCCA. Um, and so he comes to George, he's near the end, he goes, you know what the real problem is? Nobody takes any responsibility. And all of us thought, oh God, here goes George, got tax state government, Democrats, you know, we're gonna go back to it. And I think he saw that. And he said, no, wait, 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 wait. I, I don't mean that. I mean, nobody takes responsibility, nobody, not me, not any of you in this room, we keep acting as if somebody's got to come in and fix our problems for us. 
Someone's got to come in and make it right for us. If, if so, we start a lot of our sentences, if only, if only they would, if only they would give me this, if only I had the resource, if only I had more personnel, da 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 da. That's always got to be somebody else that comes in and does for us. You know, so a lot of us were really struck by that. So at the end of the two nights, we voted to tell Mike no one was interested in reorganizing state government. So, so he stopped right there. But about half the room stuck around. And at the end of another few months, out came this, um, the, the, the Live Aloha program. And this was 1994. And by the way, since then, there are like 800,000 of these around the planet. You can still get one. Just ask me how, and we'll give you whatever you want to give away. But what came with that, that um, bumper sticker was a series of 11 acts that if you put the bumper sticker on, you were committing yourself to live by. And the group had very carefully selected the 11 acts to be things that it did not matter what your wealth was, what your level of power was, where you lived, what your level of influence. They all had to do with the way you live your life. Okay, so, you know, the, decide to put the bumper sticker on, I've got to live up to all 11. Well, a little way down the list was a tough one for me. It said, drive with courtesy, let others in. <laughs> uh, okay, I live in New Wanu Valley. And if you know downtown, uh, you got to come up Alakea, and then you go around Central Intermediate and you go up to Pali. Okay, if, if you're doing the right thing, there's one lane on Alakea that goes straight through that goes up around Central Intermediate. And that one backs up like blocks down. And then as you cross over Baratania and you're coming by, you know, by St. Andrew's Priory over there, um, people cut in at the last minute. I mean, people who have not been waiting in line or doing the right thing come diving in at the last minute. I used to be so offended at that. I'd like lock bumpers with a car in front of me, you know. No, you're not coming in, you know. Four behind, you, uh, behind me wants to let you in. That's their problem. <laughs> but sometimes they'd force their way in, right? Didn't want to cause an accident. So, I, you know, I'd be really angry with these people. And as I'm going around Central Intermediate, I'm trying to see if I can see who's in the car. and. Thinking, you know, how did your parents raise you? You know, what is wrong with you people? Get in line, you know, wait. Uh, and then, so I, I put on the bumper sticker, okay, I have to be good. So every day when I went there, I have to find someone to let in. It's my responsibility, right? Okay, first thing is most of the time there was no one to let in. I mean, that's the reality. Um, Hawaii queues up about as good as any place on the planet. We're just real good at it. We wait in line with each other. We really do. People don't cut much. Uh, you know, and, and, uh, and, and, and yet we let those one or two or three or four become everybody. You know, so we get irritated at someone who cuts in line. Go, oh, those people are cutting in line. If you actually sit there and look at it, very few people do. Second thing, though, I noticed was, you know, the act of, of, of letting them in when they came was real simple. You know, I go, oh, come in. You know, and if they turned around and waved, that was fine. But if they didn't, um, that was okay too, because the main thing for me was to let them in. And then, you know, I'd go on. And, and, and I thought about it after a couple days, and I realized something. All of those days that I had been angry driving up the poly at the person who cut in wasn't bothering them at all. <laughs> I mean, they were sailing home, radio playing, happy as could be. I'm the angry one. And it was chewing me up inside with all this anger. So instead of that, the moment I let them in, I was good because I had given them a gift of letting them in. But more importantly, I let go of that transaction instantaneously. And as, as I'm going around Central Intermediate, the radio's playing, I think about going home to Cindy and the girls. I was happy, I was moving back off of whatever was going downtown to, to my life at home. You know, that's, that was a, a revelation for me about how much of this is all about us. And the more in my life I've thought about leadership, leadership first and foremost is about all of us who choose to do it. If you choose to be a leader, you are making a gift. 
to the people around you. And if you choose to lead change, you are making an awesome gift to people around you. Change leadership is the toughest form of leadership there is. So if you do it, please don't do it for popularity. Don't do it for fame. Don't do it for wealth. Don't do it for honors. Um, do it because you want to make a better place. Do it uh, because you want the people around you and yourself to have a better workplace. Do it because you want things to be effective or more productive or whatever it is you want out of your workplace. And do it to be right with yourself. Do it because leadership and leading a place well makes you feel right about what you're doing. So instead of driving angry, I drove with peace. Because I didn't let the act of anybody else change what I was. What I was was entirely in my control. I once heard someone say, oh, uh, you aloha me, I aloha you. Oh, after all the years of the people talking to me, I knew that was wrong from the moment I heard it. Aloha is not an act of reciprocity. Aloha is a gift. It's a gift from deep inside of you that you make. If it gets reciprocated, fine. If it doesn't, the gift is complete the moment you give it. Leadership is the same way. Great leadership in particular is the same way. Lead well. And then don't worry about the rest. You know, lead with your heart. Lead to do the right things. Be willing to have people be irritated with you. Lead with aloha. That means fully from your spirit and from everything inside of you doing what's right. And know that change does cause people to resist. I teach a class at the University of Hawaii in leadership. And every semester, I, I, I go up on the blackboard and I say, OK, why do people resist change? And I always get this great list. You know, status quo is a right. No one told them why. Might make mistakes on the other side. Um, there's always a challenge in, in retraining or in doing things. So get this list of about 20 things on the board. And then afterwards, I say, OK, what do all those things have in common? People look at it for a while. Usually someone in the room goes, you know, they're all about the people making the change. That's exactly right. Everything on that list, almost always, is about the people making the change. It's not about the leader asking for the change. Now, that doesn't mean that when you lead change, they won't say, frickin' Robbie. <laughs> they will. I guarantee it. I guarantee you I've seen dartboards with my picture on it. <laughs> After I took over at First Hawaiian Bank, a year later they did a survey of employees. Number one finding was get rid of the new guy. <laughs> That's okay. As long as you understand that what's going on is a human process of resisting change and don't take it so personally. Understand that's your role. And they will get irritated at you. And they will personalize their discomfort with you rather than acknowledging it's their own personal discomfort. And so as leaders, again, it's your spirit. Stand up and be OK with that. Because if you don't let it get to you and you don't turn that into something negative, it will be OK. Because we as human beings also adjust very well. And if we're led well with integrity and with spirit, we will adjust even quicker. So you know, as, as the other speakers have said, you know, I came here in part because I greatly admire what you're attempting to do. You know, and if the state is able to make this change, and we tried it, by the way, when I was there and it didn't work. You know, we try, we've tried over time to have, have the work you do um, be the focus and the leadership of change. And it has not always, it has not worked in the past. But I think you've got more going this time. And I think you have a real shot at doing it. But the kind of leadership you need takes a spirit from within you that is a bigger spirit than the challenges. And for me, if you do it with aloha and with the spirit of love for others, you will be successful. Thank you.